Ever released a bass that floated belly up and never swam down? Many anglers use a needle and a technique called fizzing to help them swim away. But does that actually help or harm bass? A new study looked into this, and what they found could change the way you release bass if you want them to survive. So there's nothing worse than when you catch a great big fish, you're so excited, you take pictures, you weigh it, then you release it, it won't swim down. I used to think that I knew exactly how to treat these fish, how to take care of them best, make sure that they swim away and live to fight another day. Well, this study really dove into it and gives a lot of really specific insights and real-world applications that I think we can use for our fishing. This study was published in December of 2024. It was done by Carleton University in Ontario, Canada, and it was peer-reviewed. So what bass have is a swim bladder, and think of it like a balloon or something. You can add air to it, take air out, and the more air that's in it, the higher they're going to float, the less air, the deeper they're going to go. And they can adjust this uh, over time. And you see this when you catch a fish out of deep water and you hold it for a while in your live well or keep it out of the water too long, taking pictures and stuff. When you go to let it swim back down, it'll go up on its side or go belly up in the live well or on the surface can't swim down. That's a barrel trauma. Basically, they're not able to get down there. And if you were able to add weights or something and sink them down there, they'd be fine. But under their, their own power, basically, they're not able to swim down to the depths to be able to upright themselves. Now, the work around this has been by fizzing them. And basically, they're specially designed needles. And basically, you take these needles, you puncture the side of the fish, you release some of the air, and they swim upright perfectly in your live well. Uh, you know, they can swim back down. And what this study wanted to take a look at was specifically in smallmouth bass, take a bunch of them and then see what happens based on how little or how much you fizz these fish or do nothing to what happens in the real world. Now the researchers noted that in the research on fizzing, it's not real conclusive. There's some that show positive results, some that show negative, and even at the agency level, there's not agreement. Some states like Florida and Texas, the official state uh, like Parks and Wildlife Department, they actually recommend fizzing, show you how to do it, and then other places like Minnesota, the state agency there, the Game and Fish, bans it. So there's no agreement. But then when you look at the tournament level, some of the organizations like Bass, for instance, they're kind of leaders in this. They actually teach their anglers when they go to smallmouth fisheries exactly how to do it. They have videos out there at pre-tournament meetings. They give... Uh, guidance on how to save these fish and if you've ever been in a tournament with deep caught fish you know that almost all those from 20 30 feet and deeper smallmouth and largemouth they go belly up they swim upside down in the live well the whole day and if you fizz them those fish go right side up swim well so there's disagreement between the tournament organizations between anglers one angler next and state agencies and then the other thing is in the research a lot of the research has done been done in laboratories, but then they're not really tested out in the lake in real world conditions. And that's what they really want to take a look at here. So this study for the researchers and, you know, partly I was wondering on these, I think it's partly an excuse to go fishing while you get paid to do it. And bravo to these guys because they're getting info for us and they're getting to go fishing. But they caught 106 smallmouth ba bass on Lake Rideau, Big Rideau, in southeastern Ontario. I'm hoping to get that name right. But they did this in August, so it was warm. They caught 106 smallmouth, and then they tested them various different ways. They averaged 14 inches, so pretty decent-sized uh, adult smallmouth bass. Now, they tested two different variables on this. Whether they fizzed them and how long was one of them, and the other was after you did that, where did you release them? So the shallow and the deep when they released and what they considered shallow was 10 meters or about 30 feet. So, you know, kind of it's August. That's pretty typical smallmouth habitat. And then the deep, this lake must have some deep water. It was like 50 meters deep. So you're talking like 150 feet deep. That's the shallow and the deep. And then they also varied how long they fizzed them. They have a control group and those they didn't fizz at all. And these fish, now they were caught shallow. They actually caught these fish shallow. So none were caught deep. Uh, to me, that's kind of a flaw in this thing. I would like to have seen these fish actually caught deep because that's more like the real world. But either way, what they wanted to test were fish that weren't floating uh, up already. 
I, you know, if it was me, I would have caught them deep. I wanted fish that had this problem and see if you helped or hurt, but they caught these fish pretty shallow. So just a few feet deep. And like I said, they did three different groups with them. They did the control, don't fizz them at all. Then they did a probe or ones where they put it in for the recommended amount. Basically, they put in the needle, the puncture group, they called it. They punctured them. They put in the needle until the first air bubble showed up. This is the proper amount where you just take out some of the air, but not all of it. That was the puncture group. And then the third group was the fizz group. And this one, they took the needle in and they put it until the last bubble came out. This is basically over fizzing them. You basically take all the air out of the swim bladder. So they're not going to be able to orient very well. So you have the control group, the partial one, which is the puncture, and then the fizz group where they take all of them out. And then they split those into two subgroups. So they took each of those and they released them in the shallow water, that 30 foot deep, or they released them in that deep water, 150 feet deep. Now just to back up a second, I said they were caught a few feet deep. I should clarify that. They were caught anywhere from about two feet deep to about 18 foot deep. But like I said, none were upside down. None had that, that barrow trauma, obviously, where they couldn't swim down. But they caught the fish, and then after that, they were held in the live well to simulate like being in a tournament. They averaged about 55 minutes in the live well. And then from there, I'll put up a picture. They, they made this ingenious little uh, apparatus here. It was a Velcro strap that went around the fish. They put a biologger, which measured movement, stuff like that. And then they tied a uh, fishing line to it. So basically, these fish could swim down, and they would let them swim around for 10 minutes and then see what happened after they spent that 55 minutes in the live well. And the neat thing with this study is then after the 10 minutes, they had like a quick release on that Velcro strap. So they pulled the line and able to take that off them. Fish could go about its business. And they also had an underwater drone that they used some so they could go down and some of these fish that wonder what they're doing, they actually swam that drone down there and uh, they could see what the fish were doing during that 10 minute period that they studied them. So I'll put up a little chart here from the study and you can see pretty clearly this one on the left, this is at the deep, at the 150 foot section versus the shallow on the right. The blue is how many did not sink. Those are the ones that you know didn't go to the bottom. The brown, that's the ones that went to the bottom and you can see how high that level is in 150 feet of water. I mean, that's deep. They're probably not going down there naturally. When you look at the fish that were fizzed, 58% uh, of the ones that were over fizzed, almost 60% went all the way to the bottom in 150 feet of water. And then 61% of the ones that were fizzed to the proper amount, you know, the recommended fizzing, 61% of those went all the way to the bottom as well. So basically 60% of the fish that got a needle in their side went all the way to the bottom in the deep. Now in the shallower, you can see that brown line's a lot more similar. And of course, 30 feet of water going to the bottom is not the same as going to 150 feet. In that shallower water, they didn't, they basically all of them went to the bottom about the same. But if you look at that left part of the graph there, the control graph, the control group, the ones that get fizzed at all, only a few of those went all the way to the bottom. Uh, the brown line's really short there. And then that middle and second one, you can see how high the brown is. Obviously the fizzing, those fish went all the way to the bottom and that's immediately went there and then stayed there. And then I'll put up another picture right now. And this is actually from the drone there. And you can see the fish on the bottom here. You look at the one in the deep, I mean, it's on the bottom not doing so great. I mean, that thing looks like he's DOA in 150 feet. Uh, the one in the shallow, which is, you know, shallow, 30 feet, but pretty standard smallmouth habitat. I mean, it's laying on the bottom, but it's kind of upright. Looks like he's got a shot. That one in 150 feet, that's not good. Now that Velcro band had a activity sensor on it as well. And here's another interesting thing from it. The fizz fish that were released over deep water had much more activity meant meaning more strenuous and harder swimming than fish released in shallow water. And even the punctured ones, the ones that weren't fizzed as much, those ones had a lot higher activity levels. They swam a lot harder than the ones that were released in shallow water. So basically the ones that were released deeper, even the ones that didn't go to the bottom, but the ones that were able to stay up, they had to swim harder. Basically they had to struggle not to go deep. And ones released deeper, 
they had to swim harder and more than the ones that released shallow. So if they were punctured or fully fizzed, those fish had to swim actively to keep from sinking to the bottom, especially when they were, were released out deep. They had to struggle to keep from going to the bottom, whereas the ones in that shallower water, they didn't have to swim quite as hard. But all of them, if they were fizzed, were punctured, they had to swim against that dropping effect, basically. At least in this study, and on smallmouth bass, you can see that fizzing them, using that needle to help vent gas in their air bladder, definitely, definitely inhibited their ability to control their depth. It was worse in the deep water, but a number of those fish, shallow or deep, uh, weren't able to keep themselves from going to the bottom. And then you could see the other ones that they had to fight really hard, swim very actively to keep from going to the bottom. Now, what was interesting here was the fact that it really didn't matter, especially in the deep water, whether they were fizzed correctly or what's thought to be correct until they're neutrally buoyant or they were fizzed totally the amount that you fizzed them really didn't matter. They were going to go to the bottom, especially how deep, either way, in about equal numbers. So the amount of the fizzing or how you did it didn't matter a whole lot. Basically what they thought here was the fact that it wasn't how much you fizzed them, but it was the actual puncture wound itself. When you had the wound there, that was the problem. And in the wild, a lot of these fish, when they're first released, where do they go? They don't go sideways, they swim straight down. And these fish, when they spook away from the boat when they go away from the boat and when they go straight down that the increasing pressure as they go deeper was enough pressure to actually basically build up enough air pressure to force that that uh, hole that you made with the needle to reopen and didn't matter how much air was out when they got enough pressure on them they theorized that basically that pressure was reopening that hole and fo forcing most or all of the air out of their swim bladder, thereby causing them to go all the way down. And they did know that this was different than some of the laboratory tests already. There were some on cod and notably on largemouth bass that showed that the swim bladders healed pretty quickly. But those were done in laboratories. This was done over deeper water. And what they saw here, at least in smallmouth, maybe their air bladder is different than largemouth. Maybe it's the same. Maybe it's the fact that it's in deeper water. But in this case, that puncture was opening up again really quickly. And then a couple other takeaways as well. Even the fish that did go to the bottom, they had to struggle and work a lot harder just to maintain position in the water column uh, to not go to the bottom. So that was forcing them to work harder once they were released. And then the big takeaway too was the ones in the shallow water, they didn't have near the sinking problems that the ones in the deep water did. So shallower, definitely seem like less uh, strain on the fish, less of them forced to go to 150 feet because as the researchers theorized, basically those ones that went to the bottom at 150 feet, none of those moved. If they were dead already, maybe, maybe not, but there's gonna be low oxygen down there. If they're pinned to the bottom, gonna have some adverse effects. Those ones that went to the bottom there, that's probably a death sentence for those fish. So the deep water, definitely not the way to go. Now the researchers noted that this study, you know, they only watched for 10 minutes and that they were held in live well for about 55 minutes on average. So more research is definitely needed to see what happens, how long, you know, this one's on smallmouth, how long it takes for their air bladder to heal and seal up and what happens after 10 minutes. This isn't the inclusive, the conclusive study, but it definitely showed that more research needs to be done. And then in the meantime, they made a couple recommendations. For fishermen like us, if you're a recreational angler, if you try to fizz a fish, now if it won't go down, if it stays on the surface, I mean, the thing's gonna die anyway, right? It, it's struggling to get down. If you fizz it though, release it over shallow water. You release it over deep water, really deep water, it's going down to the bottom, can't get off, off the bottom. So the best thing to do if you are gonna fizz them, definitely release them in shallower water. And then the other takeaway on this is really for tournament organizations. Uh, you know, if you get anglers in smallmouth tournaments, say like that, those bass events where most of their anglers are fizzing them, or like this could be a, a summertime tournament on say like the Tennessee River, a Kentucky Lake or Pickwick or something like that, where you're fizzing a lot of fish. A lot of them are uh, fizzed already. And sometimes tournament organizations, when they see fish that are upside down, they'll fizz them too to help them get, them get upright. The thing is those release boats, what they've always done in the past, when you have a release boat, they usually take those fish and they want to get good, 
cool deep water that's oxygenated especially in the summertime so it's away from the bank what they do is typically take the release boat way offshore out into the middle of the lake in the deepest part of the lake and turn them loose there well as we saw here like 60 percent of them they went straight to the bottom so the big takeaway on this for tournament organizations if you're having fizzed fish the best thing you can do is not let them go in super deep water again put them in those shallower areas where they can control their swim bladder versus being forced all the way to the bottom in really deep water. Overall, I'd say this study gave some pretty good practical advice for fizzing fish where you want to release them should help with the likelihood that they swim away. If you're looking for more science studies, how you can catch more fish, understand fish better, check out my full science playlist.